Welcome to Boring Topics. I'm sure you recognize many of the iconic planes of World War II. The Spitfire, the American Mustang, the Japanese Zero. However, how many Soviet planes can you name? The Soviet air effort was hampered from the start by the poor quality of the aircraft and shoddy training. When the chief of the Soviet Air Force brought this to Stalin's attention, he was arrested and shot. As a result of this, the Soviet Union started the war with many poor or obsolete aircraft, and the German Blitzkrieg successfully destroyed the bulk of the Soviet Air Force in the first week of Operation Barbarossa. This led to a frantic rearmament race as the Soviets desperately attempted to get planes and pilots into the air to wrestle air superiority away from the Luftwaffe. A good example of the quality of the planes the Soviet Air Force fielded at the start of the war would be the Polykarpov I-16. This speedy and maneuverable open cockpit monoplane was an advanced design when it was created in the early 1930s. But by the outbreak of World War II, it was greatly outclassed by the Me 109 and other German fighters. It suffered from being only lightly armed, possessing only four wing-mounted machine guns. Nevertheless, at the outbreak of the German invasion, about 60% of the Russian Air Force was equipped with this plane, whose pilots suffered enormous casualties against the newer German planes. One of the more modern Russian fighters of 1941 was the Lavochkin Gorbanov Gudkov, or the Lag-3, an unusual fighter design that was almost entirely composed of wood. With a respectable top speed of 348 miles per hour and a strong armament of one 20mm cannon and two 4.7mm machine guns and two more 7.62 machine guns, it was well armed. However, its all-wood construction left it vulnerable to enemy fire. Its radial liquid-cooled engine caused maintenance issues, and this aircraft was phased out by 1943 in favor of the Lavonovich LA-5 and 7. Both of these Soviet aircraft were not up to the level of the Luftwaffe. In contrast, the Germans started the Eastern Front with a great fighter. The Messerschmitt 109 was the primary German fighter at the start of Operation Barbarossa. The ME-109 had a large number of varieties produced. The ME-109F was the newest variant and proved to be devastatingly effective against the Soviet Air Force. It greatly outclassed the I-16 in both speed, armor, and firepower, and also outclassed the Lag-3, although the gap was not quite as large. By the middle of the Eastern Front campaign, both the German and Russians had upgraded their fighters significantly, with the Soviet Air Force receiving fighters that could finally match or exceed the Germans. One of the major new Soviet fighters was the Lavonovich LA-5, which was introduced in mid-1942 and featured an air-cooled engine and dual 20mm nose-mounted cannons. It could also carry up to 330 pounds of bombs or rockets. Most of its service was as a versatile ground attack and medium-altitude fighter. Its speed of 402 miles per hour and a robust armament made it a match for the Luftwaffe in both of its roles. The leading Soviet ace of World War II, Ivan Kojub, often used this fighter with great success in air combat. Another significant mid-war Soviet aircraft was the Yak-3, which was actually one of the lightest fighters of World War II at only 6,000 pounds. It had an excellent top speed of 447 miles per hour and was highly maneuverable, though it did have a high stall speed. With a hub-firing 20mm cannon and two 12.7mm machine guns, it was well-armed and a match for both the ME-109 and the Focke-Wulf 190. By the middle of the war, the Germans had also upgraded their primary fighter. The Focke Wolf 190 was a radial powered fighter that combined a great speed of 408 miles per hour with a robust airframe and strong armament. The aircraft was created primarily as a high altitude interceptor, although it served well on the Eastern Front where altitudes were typically lower. The Focke Wolf 190D variant is generally regarded as the best piston powered German aircraft of the war. It came in a wide variety of layouts, including ground attack variants. Now now let's take a look at the bombers on both sides. The Russians produced their own medium bomber, the Elation 4. This bomber was sturdy and had a reasonable payload of 2,000 pounds. Its range of only 1,600 miles meant that it would not be a true strategic bomber. It suffered from poor defensive armament and was used primarily as a nighttime bomber. Even then, it suffered heavy losses from the German night fighters. Despite this, over 10,000 were produced. The Germans' own medium bomber, the Henkel 111, had a heavier payload at over 4,000 pounds, but like the Elation, lacked the range to be a true strategic bomber. It was also used as a naval bomber. With over 7,300 produced, it was the backbone of German bombing power. Both sides lacked a true strategic bomber, but they certainly had excellent ground attack aircraft. 
One of the best ground attack aircraft of the war was the Elation II. Boasting a heavily armored fuselage and an armored cockpit, its pilot was well protected from enemy ground fire. Its initial design did not include a tail gunner, which made it quite vulnerable to enemy fighters. This deficiency was quickly rectified, after which it served quite successfully throughout the war. Later in the war, the Elation 10 was created as a modification of this design. This variant was highly successful as a tactical bomber. The two variants had a production of over 35,000. The Germans on the Eastern Front utilized the much type Stuka dive bomber as their tactical bomber. Devastating in both the Polish and French campaigns, the Stuka proved very vulnerable in the Battle of Britain when it faced modern fighters. At the beginning of the air war on the Eastern Front, it once again operated with near impunity as the Germans rapidly attained complete air superiority over Soviet airspace. With its initial load being one 500 pound bomb or 400 pound bombs, it could provide superbly accurate firepower on both fixed positions and enemy armor. The G variant of the Stuka removed the bombs in favor of two 37mm cannons. This variant proved highly successful as an anti-armor tactical bomber. Eventually, it was replaced by the ground attack variants of the Focke Wolf 190. The air war on the Eastern Front in many ways mirrored the ground war. The Germans enjoyed an initial advantage in quality. By quickly decimating the Soviet Air Force, they were able to maintain the upper hand until the middle of the war. By then, the weight of Soviet aircraft production improved models began to tell. By the later parts of the war, the balance of power shifted toward the Soviets in the air as it had on the ground. The Soviets may have started the war behind the Germans in aircraft design, but they ended the war in the same league as them 